morning. Good morning, Real Life Church. Good Everybody good? Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. Hope your week has been glorious. This is the start of a brand new one, and you're in the right place. So uh, I'm excited that you're here, excited to get into week four of uh, Make War. We've got one more week of this, and then... Um, then we will actually have our celebration weekend. I want to kind of give you a little bit of information about that. I know they've been talking about it, but uh, on the 10th, 11th, and 12th of September, we're going to be having services each night. So Friday night at 6, Saturday night at 6, and we're going to be having, uh, like I said, just serve, worship services that night. There'll be speakers. We're bringing back some staff. We're bringing uh, Mike Freeman is going to be coming back. My dad's going to be on platform that weekend, talk a little bit. Uh, some of you remember Mike, some of you may not. Uh, Walt McKay, so just some, old, some friends of Real Life Church that have been with us where we've been. Uh, we're going to have, uh, I know some people on the platform on Saturday night also along with me, and then I'll be preaching Sunday morning here in Pastor Brandon in Gainesville on Sunday. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do fireworks Saturday night to celebrate our 10 years. That's actually the 10-year celebration of Real Life Church. Just some fun stuff, so I want you to be here. Make plans to be here. Make plans to invite some folks to be here. Also, that weekend, we're going to be doing a special offering. That weekend, we're going, to, we're going to take a weekend offering called The Best is Yet to Come. And we're just going to focus that on taking us from where we are to where God wants us to be. Because, honestly, I have been really, really enjoyed the first 10 years. How many of you have enjoyed the first 10 years of Real Life Church? It's been great. God's blessed us. But I also know that any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, it's not a good way to do ministry. I'm ready, I'm ready for the weekend of the 12th because I, I'm ready to go forward into what God is calling us to do. Uh, looking back is always an enjoyable thing. It's always sometimes a, a great thing as I'm going to preach today. But I, I want to make sure that we're looking forward in ministry. I think God has called us to great things. I think God has called some of you to great things that you don't know about yet. And I want you to experience that. I want you to find that in the years to come. I don't know what the next 10 years is going to look like or 20 years is going to look like. But I know it's going to be a lot of fun allowing God to do some radical things that he, like he's done in the past. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you the, the pride, and I, I mean that in the best positive way that I can, um, that I have in being able to call myself the pastor of this church. Not because we started it, not be, but because of what God has done through it. And the way we've tried to keep it open to allowing God to do great things through it. And ultimately, that means doing great things through you, the people that are in it. And so that weekend, be prepared for that. The best is yet to come offering will be happening each night that weekend uh, as we go and we just prepare for what God's going to do for us in the 10 years to come. I, I don't know, but I, I think people are, 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 I've heard that the people are going to the moon now, that you can buy a ticket and go to Mars, you can travel in space, and uh, maybe in the next 10 years we'll have information on a spaceship about real life church. Um, <laughs> Or, or, maybe, or maybe we won't. Maybe we won't. It's okay. It was just a test right there. I was just seeing where you guys, if you were with me or not. So uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Again, let me give you some review here as we get into this. Week one, we talked about choosing sides. We said there is this battlefield and there is a valley in the middle. The valley in the middle will let you know no one lives in the valley, and so you are either in or out. You're in the battle, you're not in the battle. You're either a child of God or you're an enemy of God. We said you got to make a choice. And that's a hard choice to make. It's not an easy choice to make. People go, yeah, it's absolutely easy. It's not as easy. There is adversaries from every side. And so it's imperative that we continue that message. Christians continue that message that there is a way that is right. It is the way. He is the way, the truth, the life. But it also, the Bible tells us that there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end is destruction. We have to be vocal about the reality that there is a heaven and then there is a hell, and it depends on the choice you make while you're here. Yeah. Amen. Choosing sides is, and people say, well, I don't want to choose sides. In reality, that's going to happen. You're going to, by default. And so I would just implore you to be a people that, that challenge people to make the right decision. The second week we talked about the giant of regret. Sometimes things come at us and they don't stop. Our giants, whether we drag them with us. And we said when these things come up in our life, these giants come up in our life, we reminded ourselves that, that there were some things we could tell ourselves. The things we told ourselves was that I am completely forgiven. 
I am valuable and chosen, and I am loved unconditionally. How many of you are still thankful for those three promises? Yeah. And then last week, we talked about the power of position. I, if I'm being honest with you, I could preach that sermon. I could have preached each one of those three points in a series with each one of those three points. And we could have been about 12 weeks in that one topic of position. Uh, obstacles over opportunities. Insecurity over confidence. Fear over faith. You say, no, it's faith over fear, Pastor Vince. No, I know what it's supposed to be. But so often we live opposite of what God calls us to do. And so the, the whole idea of power of position is something that's, that's been resonating and kind of resting in my heart. Uh, and then this week I want to talk about the idea that sometimes it's good to look back. How, how, many, of you, how many of you got good, good memories from your past? I mean, like, the, 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 like the, the moments that formed you. We, we, Dallas and I grew up in a family that took us to church. Dallas and I both from the time we were... We were born, and you know, we even joke and said we've gone to church since nine months before we were born. Is how long we've gone to church, and and so we grew up in that kind of environment where we knew what it, it was just part of our fabric. Growing up, the Sunday morning or Sunday school, Sunday morning worship, Sunday night worship, Wednesday night worship. Uh, every third Sunday, we'd have a fellowship dinner after Sunday morning service, and we'd, we'd be at church all day long. You know, those Sundays were pretty great because that meant my dad wasn't going to preach on Sunday night because he was too full of food and exhausted from Sunday morning. So those Sunday nights is when he'd go, I just feel like the Lord wants us to have testimony service. And he'd allow people to testify and he'd go, that was so good, we're just going to stop right there. And I appreciated what he was doing, but I also know he was exhausted uh, through those long Sundays. But it was part of our fabric. And then as we got older, it wasn't just that that was part of our fabric. We also... We also sang together, so it was a Friday, a Saturday, traveling somewhere on Sunday to go sing and, and just be a part of that. It was who we were, and, I, and as I look back, I'm so thankful. I used to be really frustrated because uh, Dallas was born, and Dad and Mom kind of settled a little bit. It's a few years after he was born, they settled, and Dallas lived in Ohio for, what, the first 18 years, 19 years of your life? Pretty much was where he went to school, where he kind of got his roots in there. I, never, I didn't have that option, but when I came along, my dad was still trying to figure out ministry. And so I went to nine different schools before I was a freshman in high school. And it wasn't that we moved all that much. It just like every year I went to the last year of this school and then would have to switch schools. And so uh, I, I used to hate that. I used to think, man, what kind of parents did I have? That was abuse. I was a little spoiled, and I thought, I can't now, and, and, and then my dad didn't have a lot of help as a bivocational pastor, and so when I was about 10 years old, my dad got me my first set of dress clothes, like nice dress clothes, and, and, and not that I didn't have Easter stuff before, but like these were everyday dress clothes, because at about 10 years old, I started doing funerals with my dad. You're like, well, that's pretty morbid. I did weddings too, and I, I won't tell you which ones I enjoyed more. But I would have to go. He would say, hey, I need you to come with me. Okay, I'll go with you. And I didn't know what I was going to do at a funeral, but I stood at the back door with my hands like this, and I nodded at people as they walked by because that was all I knew to do. And so I started ministry very, very young. And as I look back, I think, I can't believe he made me do all that. I can't believe he took me to 10 years old to funerals. I can't believe it. And now looking back, I go, oh, Lord, thank you so much that you begin preparing my heart for ministry before I ever knew what you were doing, that you had placed an anointing on my life that I was just waiting for the appointment to come, and when the appointment came, I would be ready to go. And so I look back at my past, and I go, man, there are some great things that I can glean from it. Now, obviously, we can look at the flip side and go, man, there are some moments that I would love to forget. Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah. And we're not going to talk about those, because we'd love to forget them. Today, I want, I want to look in David's life. I saw a quote this week, and, and it was just kind of, and it didn't even say who it was from, so I don't know that it was important enough to anybody else, but I want to, I want to walk through what it said because I think it's really critical in looking at an attitude that we need to have in, when, in fighting our battles. Here's what the quote simply says. It says this, the past is experience. That's where we learn our stuff. Good or bad, how many of you have learned from your past? 
We start this from the moment we're very little. If we try to touch the stove, somebody smacks our hand and says, hot! Or they don't smack our hand and we understand for ourselves that it's hot. I remember when I was in Michigan, we had the kerosene wall heaters. I brought my gloves in one afternoon and I threw my gl- I took them off and I thought, that's warm, they'll dry quicker. And I threw them on top of the kerosene heater. And they didn't get on top of it, they actually went right inside the grate of the kerosene heater. And I had these little nylon melted clumps of glo- what used to be gloves. And my dad said, now look, you just ruined that heater because the rest of the house is going to smell like this nylon and glove. For, so we got to get rid of it. So we, we ended up having to get a new heater. And I learned a lesson about the heat and what it does. Not because somebody had to tell me, because I, just, I walked through it. I've also learned lessons in other ways where there were great lessons on, on how to act in, like I said a moment ago, in a, in a funeral situation or, or when people are struggling or, or what's the right thing to say or when it's just best to not say anything at all. Those are moments that I learned because of my past. I learned that you can't drive really fast through Greenbrier, Arkansas. And even slower through Damascus. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have not had that experience, and I'm just giving you a lesson so you don't have to learn. Slow down. All right? Some of you have learned things in relationships where you go, I should have never been in that situation, and I was. And then some of you keep repeating the same situation in your relationship. So our past is valuable. Our past is our experience, though. Those are things that we have went through that have formed how we think. Second part of this statement says this, the present is experiment. We have no idea what's going to happen. I could preach this sermon in this service and everybody stare at me like I spoke a different language. And in the very next service, it'll be taken a completely different way. And even in the third one, it's received even differently than that. Because it's all experiment. What I say, how it comes out, how it's presented, what words are on the page. Even in writing them down, I'm sitting there in hope and in faith going, Lord, I believe this is what you're telling me to say. But at the end of the day, it's experiment. It's left in the hands of something else. I hope that it works out. And all of our decisions, every decision that you make is based off of your past experience or a hope that things may be different. That's how we make every decision that we make. If, if you pour milk in the morning into your coffee, it's because you tried coffee in the past and thought this needs a little something else. Now some of you are like, no it doesn't. That's because you tried coffee in the past and then you, didn't, you couldn't afford milk or, or any creamer or sugar or anything that makes it good. <laughs> It's all based on your past experience. And so you make these decisions. I know that there are certain things I can do with a car based on past experience. I also know there are limitations to what some vehicles will do based on past experience. I, I, know, I know when to do certain things because of what I've been through. And so it's an experiment, really. And, and I think that's always interesting because people go, no, it's just, just too simple. No, the reality is it's true because if you go to order food today and you sit down at a restaurant and you sit down at a perfectly good steakhouse and you go, I think that I'm going to have something that's absolutely not steak or anything that's on the menu, you go, the waiter's going to look at you and go, that's, we don't do that here. Yeah, but I just made a decision. It doesn't matter because based on the experiences that you've had, you know that if you go to a certain restaurant, you're going to order certain things. How many of you right now, if you go into a restaurant, if you go into a fast food restaurant, we'll just narrow it down. How many of you know exactly what you're going to get right now? Depending on the restaurant I say, if I say you're going to McDonald's, what are you ordering? How many of you know it right now? How many of you just aren't going to McDonald's? All right. Okay, all right, all right. That's fair, that's fair. And so you, you base your decisions off these things. The, second, the third part of this is that the, the future is expectation. We see David in the text we're about to read function out of this process. The past is experience. The present is an experiment. But the future is an expectation. And I want to just walk through what David, how David responds in this. And so as we dive in, 1 Samuel chapter 17, 
We've, last week we read down to the point where now David's been offered the armor of the king. He's denied or declined the armor of the king. He says, I can't do that. And we pick up in verse 40 of chapter 17 where then David chooses to go a different route. And this is what he says in verse 40. Let me get over here. Instead, instead of the king's armor, he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi or the small brook, which that word means. And put them in the pouch of a shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine came closer and drew closer, to da- closer and closer to David with the shield bearer in front of him. David's first experience, he learned that his past had taught him to equip himself wisely. How do you know, how many of you know that there are certain things you need to take with you in your day, whether it's a good attitude, whether it's, whether it's the right demeanor, if you're going to go into a job application, you've got to kind of prepare yourself before you go in. A lot of people don't do that anymore, and it's evident that they don't do that anymore, but it's also evident that they haven't been taught how to do that anymore. We, we don't go into circumstances prepared, and I think if God's taught us anything, that we should use our past to prepare us for what things we're stepping into in our right now. God did not allow you to go through your past for that just to be wasted time back there. It ought to be lessons that you have learned, that you have brought forward. People, I hear it all, I wish I could just forget my past. Then you'd have no basis on how to make right decisions today if God allowed you to completely forget everything that you had went through. And I think too often we hope that that's what God will do, that he'll just eliminate all those bad experiences. But those bad experiences are are the the opposite side of the scale, so to speak, that that weight says, no, 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 you need to make this decision over here. And so your past is that piece that says, wait, David said, I know that in order to do this right, I'm going to need some things. And so he went to the brook, and he picks up five smooth stones. And, and we could debate why he picked up five. Why didn't he just pick up one? There's, there's story, and, and there's different theologians that may think different things, but there's really no biblical reason that it states there why David did this. We don't get his mindset of why he picked up five. It's just a detail in the story. He picks up five smooth stones and begins to walk towards the battlefield. He starts heading towards Goliath. You say, well, Vince, why why did he pick up five? I don't know why he picked up five, but he knew what he needed for the moment based on his past experiences and his future expectation. I wonder if you're making decisions in your life based off only past experiences or are you allowing God to give you a future expectation? Are you allowing God to do something bigger in your life than what he's done in the past? events, I don't know if I want God to do anything bigger in my life than what he's done in the past, then I'm not sure you completely understand what God wants for your future. See, God, God, did, God didn't save me to keep me where I was at, at 20 years old when I received Jesus. He didn't save me to keep me there and then me maintain it for my lifetime. That wasn't his intention. There was more to the story than this moment at my coffee table in my living room. There was more to the story than me just saying, yes, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. There was more to the story, but had I only expected God to keep me there, rather than had an expectation that God was going to do something great in my life, I would have missed. And so I had to prepare. I have to look back at my past and go, God, what what do you want me to do? What do you want me to take into my future? Now, how many of you have learned grit from your past? That sometimes you just got to pull up yourself and go. It's not easy. We don't like it. But there's a reality that we've learned that lesson. That's a good one to take with you. How many of you learned that prayer and Bible, studying your Bible works? Some of you go, I don't know that I've, I've learned that yet. Some, I know prayer works because I pray a lot, especially if I'm getting pulled over, if I'm in trouble. We, in Greenbrier, yeah. We laugh about it, but the reality is if we stop real, real short and we take a moment and take a look at our, our the things that we're prepared, the things that we have learned that take us forward, I don't know how much we really use the past. We shoot it down, we talk bad about it, but are you using it to really look back and go, this is what God has already done for me? We see David give this speech to King Saul. 
hey, when I was in the field, there was a lion, there was a bear, and when they came and got a sheep, I went after it. He's, what he's doing is looking back at moments where God revealed himself in a mighty way, and he's saying, because of that past experience, I can have a future expectation of what's going to happen to the giant. Because God has been good there, I am prepared, and I have prepared wisely to go into what's coming. And what I would just say as a believer, and maybe as your pastor, is this last 18 months, two years, however long this season lasts, and if this is the new normal, whatever. Whatever God has taught you about his faithfulness, take it into tomorrow. Take it into tomorrow and give it away to somebody and pour it out on somebody and utilize it to grow in your own life. Don't just get stuck lamenting the past and not being hopeful for the future. That would be an offense to the cross, is if that's what we ended up doing with our faith. Second thing, past experiences equip you to speak boldly. I love David. He's always been one of my favorite Bible people. I hate to use the word character because that sometimes makes him sound fictitious, and I don't think he was fake. And so when I think of David and I think of his boldness with the giant, with Goliath, and Goliath's arrogance, I always love this part of the scripture. It's one of the most quoted. This, this is probably David's I have a dream moment is what this is in reality. The giant comes to him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was just a youth. Healthy and handsome. Now, I don't know if the giant despised him because he was young, because he was healthy, or because he was handsome, or all three combined. But that's what it's laid out. He said to David, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? And then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, said the Philistine, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beast. It's a good day. If that's how you start your day right there. David said to him, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of the armies, the living God, the ranks of Israel. You have defiled him. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I will strike you down. I will remove your head and give the corpse of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that the Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord. He will hand you over to us. Now, I love that David is so specific in what he says. We'll see it here in a little bit, that David almost becomes prophetic. In fact, he does become prophetic in this moment. Well, this is what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to defeat you. Then I'm going to kill you, and then the birds are going to pick the meat off the bones of the rest of your army that's going to be strewn all over the countryside. You say, that sounds like arrogance. It is arrogance unless it's God. The Lord will deliver you to me. Never once did David say, this is what I'm going to do to you like the giant had done. Come here, David, so that I can. David said, no, the Lord, the battle is already his. You don't understand, Goliath. Whether I win or I lose today, the battle is God's. But because of my past experience and my future expectation, this is where I see God showing up in the picture. Do you see God showing up in your picture tomorrow? Do you see him showing up in your picture tomorrow, or is it just something that you kind of said, you know what, I'm not sure. I hope, I, I, man, I hope he does. I, I, maybe he will, you know, or you're still trying to figure out how to do it on your own, and then you'll give God credit for it if it works out. <coughs> or you'll blame him for it if it doesn't work out. So often we see this in the church, where people will tend to gravitate towards this, this thought or this idea that, that God somehow is the one that made the mistake of your preparation or lack of preparation. How many of you love speaking boldly? Say amen. How many of you like confrontation? Say amen. <laughs> Some people love it. Some people thrive on it. I have a friend, their, their church, one of their st uh, staff values is bold conversation. And I said, what does that mean to you? 
He said it means that we can argue each, as with each other, we can scream at each other, we can dislike each other, but the moment we walk out the door, it is one way. And I said, so do you really scream at each other? He said, a lot. A lot. And so a lot of people are, are kind of afraid of that type of environment, especially in our current culture. Harsh words become a, an abuse in a lot of situations. I'm not saying I agree with that necessarily, because a lot of times truth is considered harsh words. We live in a day and age where if you just speak truth boldly, if you just say that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and no other way will get you there, then that's considered harsh speak. It's also considered hate speech in a lot of arenas, and we just know it to be truth. We just know it to be truth based on the word of God and, and based on my past experiences. I know who Jesus Christ is to me. So David's faith in Christ, his past experience, had given him the ability to speak boldly about who he was and whose he was. My daughter Vanessa is going to be a lawyer, and she is in law school. This is her first year. And I said, Vanessa, you are one of the best arguers I've ever known in my entire life. And she said, do you mean that as a compliment or uh, an insult? And I said, you're an adult now. I'm going to let you decide which way I mean that. She said, I'm going to take it as a compliment. I said, I had no doubts that you would. That she, she loves the idea of debate. She loves the idea of speaking her mind. Now, what I will also say is that when she speaks her mind, she does her very best to make sure that when she speaks her mind, it's out of a prepared mind. It's not just me exploding my vomit. It's exploding something that I've looked at, processed, studied, learned, and now we can discuss it. And I wonder how often we do that as believers or we just spout off. Because there's a difference between boldness and loudness. And I think in seasons of our history, the church as a whole, the history, there have been moments we've been really loud and we've been loud about the wrong things. And I pray for a day when that will return, when the church has the ability to be bold. To be bold in the truth. To be bold in the reality that no matter what's happening in our day today, the battle is the Lord's. No matter what's happening in your work, the battle is the Lord's. And I can be bold in that. I don't have to like everything that's happening today and in our area, in our country, in our society, in our culture. In fact, I can tell you, I'm against most of it. And my own convictions. But the reality is I have to go, you know what, no matter what's happening, I can't let it ruin my day because I have a boldness in that God already wins. God, I know he wins. I, I I don't hope that he wins. I'm not sitting here wondering if at the end of it all God's going to win. I know God wins. And David was sitting, living in this moment. The difference is he was doing it in the midst of the battlefield where that faith was about to be walked out in real time. And he had the ability in that moment when it was going to be put up or shut up. You either really believe this, David, or you're going to look like a fool in front of everybody. I wonder, put in the same situation where we, as God's children, respond. Are you willing to stand up boldly? Goliath said, I'm going to pick your bones, blood, the meat off your bones and give them to the birds of the field and the beast, or the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said, hold on, let me just clarify your statement and make sure you get it right. God has already won this battle. And because God is the one leading the battle, you will be the one that is defeated. You will be the one that is killed. And the rest of your army will be the ones getting their bones picked clean. Because God is the one that wins. Do you speak boldly because of God? Do you speak boldly because of your arrogance? Or do you just not speak at all because you're afraid of either? I don't know where you stand on that. And I would challenge you to kind of lean in to try to find out, God, am I bold in my talk because of the truth that you've put in my heart? Am I bold in my conversations because of the truth that you've put in my heart? Not my opinion, because opinions, they don't matter. We already talked about that. It does, they just don't matter. But the truth of God's word, the truth of who God is living in you, it will matter, it does matter, and it will always matter. So lean into that. Third thing, your 
past experiences equip you for new expectations. I love the fact that here you have a shepherd who's killed a lion and a bear. I don't know how big the lion and the bear were. I don't know if we're talking Kodiak bear or we're just talking small, small little field bear. I don't know. They all look the same if you're having to fight one or running from one, all right? So, but here, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know what the lion was. You can get some, some translation stuff here with the lion. This could, have been a, this could have been a mountain lion. This could have been a lion lion. This could have been a cheetah. This could have been a tiger of some sort. It was a big cat is all we know. And what we know is it was a predator coming after the sheep, and David went after it. But I love that even though he had faced those two things, an animal thinks differently than a warrior. It, it thinks, it reasons differently than a human being. And that's what Goliath was. And so even though David had these experiences, he had to have a little bit of crazy in him, and I mean crazy in a good way, to be able to stand in front of what was the greatest challenge he would have ever faced. This is different, but I'm willing to step into it. Why? Because God has been good back there, and I'm going to trust him to be good right now, and I'm going to trust him to be good tomorrow. God provided in the field. He provided me walking here, and he's going to provide me in the battlefield as soon as I get step into this. I think so often we allow our faith to be diminished. We allow our faith to be diminished. We allow it to be shrunk down. Because the world gets loud around us, because the decisions, the dissenters, all of it that we hear. And God is saying, if you'll step boldly into who I've asked you to be, if you'll trust that I am still the same God that delivered you from the bear and the lion, if you'll trust that I'm still that God, then this is no different. Trust me. Trust me and step into it. We see here that David picks up with verse 48. When the Philistines started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, he took out a stone and he slung it, hit the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. And David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. I wanna clear up your coloring book here. This is where most coloring books stop. David defeated Goliath with a sling and a stone. If you'll notice, it doesn't say that he killed Goliath with a sling and a stone. It says he defeated him. Goliath's out cold, face down, on the battlefield. Coloring book says, it's a good place for a period. Let's make the picture. Then we pick up. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David overpowered the Philistine killed him without having a sword. David ran and stood over him, grabbed the Philistine's sword, pulled it from his sheath, used it to kill him. So I need you to walk through this with me. He's taken the sword. He's run it through Goliath in some way. Then, then he cut off his head. How many of you wish that was in your coloring book? not. We're going to lean into that a little bit more next week, but I want to ask you this question. Some of you feel like you've defeated things in your life, but you haven't completely finished the job. I'm better. I'm doing better. I'm doing better. You know, I, I used to be this, and I'm doing better. And we have this progressive, progressive mindset that as long as we're doing better tomorrow and we're doing better the next day and we're doing better the day after that, then that's a win. I'm telling you, it can be a small win of a battle, but it is not the war. David here, by taking Goliath's head, ends the war. We're not just going to win the battle. We're going to end the war. We're not just going to knock him down. We're going to take him out. I wonder in your life what sin is there that you have been maybe knocking down that you, have, you really need to allow God to take out. We're going to do communion here in just a moment. And as we do that, 
there's going to be an opportunity for you to examine yourself, to look into your own life, into your own heart, into your own soul, and go, Lord, is there anything there that I really just need to get rid of, that I need to clean out, any sin that I need to repent of, any moment that I need to hand off to you, God? If it's there, I need you to reveal it to me. David's took this battle to a moment where he could have put his foot on the body, Goliath knocked out there in the, on the dirt, and he could have cheered, and everybody would have hollered and yelled, but that was not what David said. David said, no, 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 we're going to finish this thing. I want in your life you to finish. I want you to stand boldly before God with nothing separating. Amen.